Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, this, of course, is uh, Shackleton, my uh, main uh, sidekick. And uh, I'm continuing off on my discussions um, in my last few videos on security threats, basically global security threats, threats to global food supply, threats to water supply, threats to the actual power grid. Um, and uh, basically, I'm continuing to talk about the report that came out several months ago, but has been mostly ignored, um, a U.S. military report saying that the chance of the U.S. military collapsing from climate change in 20 years is an ever-increasing risk. So let me get right into where I left off in the previous video. But first of all, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the Wilson Center, okay, um, Science and Technology Innovation Program, had a conference um, in the summer on food systems and national security, the science in strategy. Okay, so there was basically this government conference and I just want to show you some of the topics, like some of the titles of the ideas. So lots of people are starting to get concerned about the consequences from abrupt climate change. And it's, it's about time. It's about time this is, this is happening. So uh, basically, security implications of the global food system relevant to the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, talk by... Uh, um, retired uh, military, food systems as critical infrastructure, vulnerabilities, risk, and resilience. Um, okay, the devil you didn't know, anticipating and managing risk in complex systems. Threats, resources, and politics, implications of climate change for the U.S. military. Models for risk, how other complex systems can inform Department of Defense relevant risks to the U.S. and global food system. And then supply chain vulnerabilities, supply chain resilience, lessons from Hurricane Maria, building domestic resilience, governance, data streams, and new institutions for U.S. domestic food system stability, improving the culture of preparedness and preparing the nation for catastrophic events critical functions, risk indexes, innovation as a force multiplier to improve preparedness, um, and so on. Now, there was something that I missed here, and I want to go back. Um, yes, there is no such thing as a new normal. Okay, so you've heard me, if you've seen my videos, lots of my videos in the past, you know that I've been saying this type of thing. There's no new normal. We're undergoing abrupt climate change because of the rate, the rate of change is, is, is always increasing. Things are happening faster than expected. There, there's no new normal. You know, we're, we're in a, we're in a, uh, re, we're in a regime of high risk, constant change, constant new threats to be addressed with climate change. So I'll go back to um, this article. Again, you have to read this. Motherboard, U.S. military could collapse within 20 years due to climate change, report commissioned by Pentagon says. So I'll go to where I, I left off. Um, and I was talking about water, I believe. Yeah, water scarcity can destabilize nations and the U.S. Army. So while sea level offers one specific type of risk, another comes from water scarcity due to climate change, population increase, and poor water management. Okay, water scarcity is a near-term risk driving civil unrest and political instability. This is not just a theory. Look at the um, unrest, look at the problems in Syria, um, look at the problems in, say, Ecuador, you know, huge numbers of people um, protesting in Quito. Look at the ongoing problems now in Chile, in, you know, specifically in San Diego. San Diego, Santiago, Chile. Um, the power company 
basically they privatized water. It's one of the countries where water is privatized. It's not, it's not the infrastructure for water is, is all private companies. And there's huge water shortages. They're in a record 60 year drought and there's no end in sight to this drought. You know, is this the new normal, this drought? Um, I said, like I said before, there is no new normal. So these things are ongoing in many countries right now, uh, putting some risk to the climate conference in Santiago, Chile, which I'm, which I've, um, I'm attending in, in about a month. So please consider um, donating to support my videos and website, but also a little bit of travel to this climate conference where I'll do probably videos at least, you know, one every, every, every few days for sure. Okay, so by 2040, global demand for fresh water will exceed availability, and by 2030, one-third of the world population will inhabit the water-stressed regions of North Africa, South Africa, the Middle East, China, and the U.S. You know, look at the U.S. Uh, southwest, Midwest, Southwest. Okay, um, the decline in water availability over the next two decades will lead to an increase in social disruption in poor, vulnerable regions. Water scarcity is a driver of global food system failure, which could, tr could trigger new outbreaks of civil conflict and social unrest. The report depicts a global food system increasingly disrupted by rapid freeze-thaw cycles in spring and fall. Uh, a number of years ago, got a freeze, you know, early on in the, in, in the spring. Um, it killed all the buds on the apples, basically cost 100 million in loss of the apple crop in, in Ontario. You know, now, uh, you know, recently in, in the plains in Canada, you know, grain belts and wheat, you know, sorghum, things like that, um, the, basically they were hit hard. Um, the winter wheat crop, uh, there was a snowstorm freezing, you know, and it caused huge disruption to the, to the harvesting of the winter crop. Soil degradation, depletion of fossil water, aquifers where water is pumped or fossil water the ancient aquifers the water's been there forever um, and uh, spread of pests and diseases to agriculture but also to people damage to shipping infrastructure due to flooding there'll be significant increases in mortality in vulnerable locations which are those where dod supported humanitarian invention intervention is most likely but foreign military inventions in water-scarce regions might not be viable unless the U.S. Army invents or acquires radical new technologies to distribute adequate levels of water to soldiers. Okay, the problem is so bad and so expensive that the Army is precipitously close to mission failure concerning hydration of the force in a contested arid environment. Water is currently 30 30 to 40 percent of the cost required to sustain a U.S. military force operating abroad. Think, think of in the Middle East, for example. 30 to 40 percent of the cost to sustain them is water. A huge infrastructure is needed to transport bottled water for army units. So the report recommends major new investments in tech to collect water from the atmosphere. Just pull water out of the air. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways to do that. There's some interesting developments without which U.S. military operations abroad would become impossible. Okay, and the biggest obstacle, that this is currently way outside the Pentagon's current funding priorities. Our priorities, the Pentagon's priorities, the U.S. government priorities are completely inadequate. They're in the opposite direction to what is required to do to start meeting some of these threats. And there is a huge blind spot, even in an article like this one, Okay, um, it, it doesn't talk about the necessity for a rapid whole size society transition away from fossil fuels. The, the report is bizarre because it actually promotes environmental stewardship in the army, but it identifies the Arctic as a critical strategic location for future U.S. military involvement to maximize fossil fuel consumption. Noting that the Arctic is believed to hold about one quarter, 25% of the world's undiscovered hydrocarbon reserves, the authors estimate that some 20% of these reserves could be within U.S. territory, noting a greater potential for conflict over these resources, particularly with 
Russia. It doesn't mention Canada here. The melting of Arctic sea ice is a foregone conclusion over the next few decades, implying major new economic opportunities will open up to exploit the region's oil and gas resources. It doesn't talk about how the jet streams will be completely messed up with a open Arctic, no Arctic sea ice, and the cascading consequences from that. The U.S. military must immediately begin expanding its capability to operate in the Arctic to defend economic interests and to partner with allies across the region, according to a quote from the report. So basically, as climate change wreaks havoc on food, water, and power systems, it's going to strain our already strained democratic systems. The bigger problem is that the U.S. military is a driver of climate change. It's one of the world's largest single institutional consumers of fossil fuels, and I'll talk about that. Um, a, so it's a huge part of the problem, you know, but the report looks at things from a narrow national security lens. Instead of encouraging governments to address the root cause through unprecedented changes in all aspects of society, these are the words of the UN IPCC report this time last year, the, 20, the 2 degree versus 1.5 degree report, the Army report demands more money and power for military agencies while allowing the causes of climate change to accelerate. So the budget in the U.S., the military budget, 700 billion this year, 700 billion for, for 2020. Okay, so rather than waiting for the U.S. military to step up after climate collapse, at which point the military itself was, is a great risk of collapsing, surely we can deal with the root cause and get rid of the chronic dependence on oil and gas that's destabilizing the entire planet. Okay, so this is a very hard-hitting report and, you know, absolutely vital to read. Um, and it's also, this is a great website to check out, the Center for Climate and Security, and also um, the, uh, the Wilson Center. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the things peripheral to what were in the report. So one of them was sea level rise. Okay, so sea level rise, destabilizing you know, threatening imports and exports, which are carried over container shipping. And container shipping, by the way, you know, up until recently, is not counted in carbon budgets of countries. Neither is airline travel, commercial airline travel, and neither are the militaries of the world. Now, in this climate crisis that we face, there, nobody, no group can get a free pass, okay? We clearly can't do this type of budgeting where we're ignoring huge, huge parts of the problem. But as far as sea level rise, you know, which was an indication as being a potential threat to Bangladesh, right? Dis displacing 80 million people, half of the population of Bangladesh who are living at sea level, you know, and over, you know, 600 million people worldwide. How much is sea level going to rise? Sea level could rise by two meters by 2100, much worse than feared, according to this report from the summer. So it talks about, um, you know, what it did is it looked at, uh, you know, it said 1.79 million square kilometers of land would, could be lost, up to 187 million people displaced, small island states in the Pacific pretty much gone. So what they did is they took evidence from 22 leading researchers on how the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets might respond to future climate change. Okay, and uh, basically the two meter sea level rise uh, risk was, was huge according to this report. So let's have a look. Um, and this is by 2100. You know, if you, James Hansen, of course, said five meters by 2100. You know, if the if the melt rates from Greenland and Antarctica continue to double with a doubling period between seven to ten years, which has happened over the last three doubling periods, over at least 21, 20, last 20 years or so, if those doubling rates continue, then we, we would, would have much more than five meters by 2100. We'd have it more, more like five meters by, you know, 2060 or something, possibly seven meters by 2070. And I've talked about this, you know, it's very controversial. Lots of people disagree, but, you know, I think that this is quite possible. So I'm going to continue this in another video. So thanks for, thanks again for listening.